Hello, I'm Tim Shurich. Today's video is dedicated to this little box of tricks here. Um, I'm hopefully in this video going to be able to tell you what this is, what it can do, how it came about and why, at least in my opinion, it's an incredibly special instrument. That's what's coming up. It's the Studio Electronics MIDI Moog. Now, no conversation about this particular synthesizer can be had without talking about Bob Moog's creation, the Mini Moog Model D. You know, we all think of the Model D as one of, if not the most revered, cherished, loved, and desired analog monosynth keyboards of all time. Um, now, it was produced back in 1970, and I think that they produced maybe about 12,000. Model Ds uh, during their manufacturing lifetime. Uh, they stopped production in 1981. Now, the Model D didn't stop production because of the digital revolution that was about to happen. That happened, I think, really in the more in the mid 80s. It was in 1983 that the first MIDI enabled instruments were produced, and it was 1983 that the Yamaha DX7 was produced. Uh, but there were dwindling sales of the Model D towards the end of its lifetime in the late 70s and into the early 80s. And I think the reason for that is just purely the competition. There were so many other analog synthesizers or analog synthesizers with some digital technology inside them uh, that were on the market that were competitors for the Model D. The Model D never was modernized after its initial design or certainly after its revision to circuit boards. Uh, they never did anything more with it. They didn't really take it further forward. Uh, Moog produced other instruments, but the Model D kind of stayed static. And towards the end of its lifetime, if you looked at it, comparing it to the competition, it was missing a lot of features that the competition had. So where does Studio Electronics and the MIDI Moog come into play? Well, in the mid-1980s, I think production of this started around 1986. Uh, I'm not sure of my facts here. I couldn't find any hard facts on it. But the mid-80s, Studio Electronics started to make this instrument. Uh, actually, Studio Ele Electronics as a company was formed in the same year that the Model D ceased production, but I think that that was a uh, coincidence rather than anything else. Now, Studio Electronics uh, initially were a, a rehousing company. They would take your synthesizer and they would rehouse it for you. They would remove the circuit boards and the other bits and pieces inside, and they'd put them into a new housing, like this one, a 19-inch rack uh, housing with MIDI capability. Because when MIDI came along and digital synthesis really took off in the 1980s, then rack-mounted instruments became incredibly popular because you didn't have to sit right in front of it anymore and it didn't have to have a keyboard anymore. You could control it remotely from your MIDI controller keyboard. So rack-mounted instruments became very, very popular. And that was another reason, I think, why the Model D uh, lost popularity even after it had stopped production. So people would actually come to Studio Electronics and say, look, here's my Model D. Can you rip its guts out and put it into a nice shiny box like this and have MIDI capability for me? Uh, and that's what Studio Electronics did, not only with the Model D, but they also did it with the Prophet 5. They did it with uh, some Oberheim instruments. I think they might have done it with the Jupiter 8 as well even. I'm not 100% sure of that, but the Model D certainly wasn't the only instrument that they rehoused like this. So 
1987, like so many other analog synth companies, Moog Music went into liquidation. It became bankrupt, unfortunately. Uh, thanks to the digital revolution that had taken place. But that was a good thing for Studio Electronics because Studio Electronics were able to snap up and buy a lot of the bankrupt stock from Moog Music. Uh, I think there's an estimate of around 500 uh, sort of sets of printed circuit boards that would should have gone into Model Ds but never got there. So suddenly Studio Electronics had loads and loads of spare parts with which to make these MIDI Moogs for the first time. They weren't a rehousing company, they were a synthesizer company, they were producing these. So they produced probably around 500 which had Model D parts inside them which were bankrupt stock and the rest of the sense that they had made were from people donating their Model Ds to create these instruments for them. So, ripping the guts out of a Model D and discarding its chassis and its keyboard might sound to many like a little bit of a counterintuitive move and possibly even sacrilege. However, the MIDI Moog has some significant advantages over an original Model D, and that's what I'm going to cover in this section. Now, to start off with, just having a MIDI to CV interface into the synth engine rather than the physical keyboard that the Model D had brings its advantages. For starters, and it sounds obvious, but you can play the synthesizer engine over a much wider octave range than you could the original Model D with its fixed size keyboard. For example, here with my montage, I've got my octave up and down buttons, so I can do this. Now as well as getting rid of the keyboard, what we're also getting rid of is the mod wheel and the pitch bend wheel, but obviously with MIDI, the MIDI Moog has got that covered because it can listen to those continuous controller messages. And in fact, you'll see here on the front panel, we have a bend potentiometer which sets the pitch bend range. At maximum, it's one whole octave. At minimum, it's nothing. And then at the halfway point that I've got it there, it's around five semitones. Now as wonderful sounding as the original Model D was, it was very basic and it had features missing from it that the competition had and this was one of the reasons why it struggled to sell as well as it really should. Moog never upgraded it, never gave it new features. It stayed the same basically for pretty much 13 years. Now I'm going to talk about two of these features which are missing from the Model D which the competition did have and I'm going to mention them because the Studio Electronics MIDI Moog has those two features built into it. The first feature is multi-trigger. So every time you hold down a note, even if you've got one held down already, the envelopes re-trigger. Multi-trigger mode. Now I do believe on a Model D that you could get this set for you at the factory, but it wasn't something you could turn on and off whenever you wanted it to. By default, your Mini Moog Model D was in legato mode. Uh, now here, as you can see here, we have a switch on the front panel, it's called multi-trigger. So it's off at the moment, so we're in legato mode and we get this kind of effect. Mm -hmm. 
And then if I turn it on, we get this. second feature that the competition had which the Model D didn't and there was no way of turning it on with a factory setting is hard sync oscillator hard sync um, now here we have the MIDI Moog from Studio Electronics and we have a little switch down there oscillator to sync it's gonna hard sync oscillator 2 to oscillator number one now there's only a point in doing this to get that kind of wonderful sync sound if you can uh, sort of set the frequency of oscillator 2 differently to oscillator number 1 and that's what this little potentiometer here is for it's called a sweep and what this does is it modulates the frequency of oscillator number 2 using the filter envelope which is a really really cool feature so if I start to turn it up Here, there, pitch going down based on this envelope. Which is a very useful feature in itself, but when you then have oscillator sync engaged. Let's lengthen the envelope. Turn up the amount. You never heard a Model D doing that, did you? Right, let's talk about modulation capabilities and how the MIDI Moog from Studio Electronics trumps the original Model D. The first thing that it's probably most well known for having is a dedicated LFO. Now with the Model D you have three oscillators and you can take that third oscillator out from tracking the keyboard and it's got a special low mode, a low frequency mode, and you use that as an LFO to modulate pitch or modulate the filter. Uh, now with the MIDI Moog uh, from Studio Electronics, it's got a dedicated LFO. You don't need to have to do that with Oscillator 3 unless you really want to, but you really do have now two LFOs, if you think about it, a dedicated one, and you still have Oscillator number 3, which you can use as an LFO. So here I've got my mod wheel turned up. I'm just going to switch mod on for the filter cutoff and if I play you a note now you'll hear there that it's being modulated by an LFO it's actually being modulated by uh, oscillator number three if I change the um, frequency of oscillator number three affecting that modulation. Now on the original Model D and as we have here with the MIDI Moog we've got a modulation mix control. Now on the Model D what that did was mix that modulation source from either full oscillator number three through to a blend round to noise. So you could actually use noise as a modulation source or oscillator number three or anywhere in between. Now in order to keep the the front panel as close to a regular Model D as possible what Studio Electronics decided to do was actually remove noise as a modulation source. That's the kind of the downside of the MIDI Moog. Remove noise as that modulation source and replace it with the dedicated LFO. So at the moment with this dial all the way around to the right we have oscillator number three and all the way to the left 
we have this dedicated LFO, which is also a triangle wave. This is the rate control here. So that is modulation with the, the dedicated LFO. And we can mix for all sorts of interesting effects. Obviously with oscillator number three, we've got a choice of waveform. We've got the triangle wave at the moment, we, but we could choose whatever waveform we want to. Let's choose Sawtooth. Now with the advent of MIDI and its native support for monophonic aftertouch, there was a proliferation of aftertouch support in synthesizers, both analog and digital in the 80s. Um, and this is again an area where the original Model D was left behind. It didn't have MIDI support and its keyboard had no monophonic aftertouch capability at all. Here in the MIDI Moog from Studio Electronics, we have that monophonic aftertouch support um, and it supports it in two ways. You'll see there are two switches, one called aftertouch VCF and the other one is called aftertouch mod. Aftertouch VCF, what that does is it will modulate the uh, cutoff frequency of the filter uh, with monophonic aftertouch in a very simple way like this. <laughs> Now, there's no way to calibrate it on the front panel with a potentiometer, it's just there. I guess if you were to go inside, there must be a way of calibrating it internally with some sort of little sort of screwdriver or something like that. Um, so, you know, to get it exactly right, how, how you'd really want it to suit your playing, then uh, that's probably something that I would need to do because at the moment it's a little bit harsh for me to control. Um, but it is there. <laughs> The second way that Aftertouch is supported in the MIDI Moog is this second switch, uh, Aftertouch Mod. So with the modulation capabilities, the mod bus inside a Model D, you would engage that, bring it into life using your mod wheel. It's exactly the same with the MIDI Moog as I've showed you already, but instead of using the mod wheel, we can use Aftertouch instead. So the mod wheel is down. I've got uh, the mod switch on. So we've just seen how with its MIDI interface that the MIDI Moog is able to respond to aftertouch messages and give that extra level of expression. There's one more way that it does this, uh, which is equally as cool, and that is 
it responds to MIDI note on velocity, which obviously is built into the MIDI standard right from version one and velocity sensitivity was proliferating throughout the synth world at a time when the Model D was kind of standing still. Um, and again, we have two ways that the MIDI Moog can respond to a note on velocity. You'll see here, uh, they're called Dynamics. Uh, we've got Dynamics VCA and Dynamics VCF. So uh, by default, those switches are off and there's no response to velocity at all. Let's turn on the first one, which is VCA response. And now we're going to have increased amplitude or the amount that the VCA envelope is applied is increased with increasing velocity like this. So starting from really, really soft. Now again, there is no way on the front panel to sort of calibrate or adjust the amount. It is what it is. Uh, and again, I think if I was to get a tech or if I was comfortable enough to get inside uh, the box of the MIDI Moog, maybe there's a way for me to calibrate it and make it a bit more sensitive, but this is what we have. However, there's a second way of reacting to velocity, and that's the second switch, which we'll just listen to on its own to start off with, Dynamics VCF. Now, this is getting velocity to affect the amount by which the, uh, the filter envelope is applied. Um, there are actually two ways to control this, because first of all, the filter envelope has got an envelope mod control, and I'm gonna whack it all the way up to maximum so we can hear the maximum effect. But the less that's turned up, then the more subtle this whole velocity effect is going to be. But in addition to that envelope mod, there is a second control here, this one here called DVCF, Dynamics VCF, and this is again controlling or attenuating that amount of velocity uh, modulation of the envelope. At the moment, it's set all the way up to max, so this is the maximum effect. more dramatic and of course we can have both switches on at the same time. Now, there's still a part of the story of the MIDI Moog still to be told, and that is what is its relationship with the MIDI Mini, another synthesizer that looks very, very similar to this, the Studio Electronics produced after it. Well, there's basically two things that happened. The first thing was that the owners of the Moog trademark uh, threatened legal action against Studio Electronics unless they changed the name of this product. This product has got the word Moog in it. It's a MIDI Moog. Uh, and that was not allowed in trademark law. So that's the first thing that had to change. The second thing that was about to change 
was the fact that Studio Electronics were going to run out of these printed circuit boards that they had acquired from Moog Music. And so they set about designing their own alternatives that would be 100% pin compatible with the original Moog boards. So that's what Studio Electronics did. They invested a lot of time and energy in developing their own printed circuit boards that they could continue to manufacture and continue to produce these synthesizers with and they also changed the name at pretty much the same time. Uh, I haven't seen any hard facts on this, a lot of hearsay and opinion, but it seems to me that all MIDI Moog synthesizers have original Moog Model D parts inside them whereas the vast majority of MIDI minis will have Studio Electronics parts in them. You might find a few that have Model D parts in them. That'll probably be because people were still donating their Model Ds to have them turned into rack mount units. Uh, but that's the basic differentiation between the, un the two units. And Studio Electronics took those designs, those printed circuit board designs, um, and they became the basis of Studio Electronics' future products, their own products, the SE1 series uh, of synthesizers that still are produced today. Mm -hmm.